my main purpose tonight is to begin the reading of the Christian archetype, a Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. I'll be reading the entire book chapter by chapter over the next few days, but this evening I'm going to begin with the preface and introduction. Preface. This book is an attempt to present in orderly fashion C.G. Jung's interpretation of the Christian myth. He is concerned to rescue for modern man the spiritual treasures which traditional religion can no longer carry. For many, God has abandoned his erstwhile dwelling in the churches and is not likely to return. We are living in what the Greeks called the kairos, the right moment, for a metamorphosis of the gods, of the fundamental principles and symbols. The numinosum is seeking a new incarnation. We can expect to find help in understanding this event by examining the great incarnation myth, the life of Christ. There's a footnote. Jung, the undiscovered self, civilization and transition, collected works, volume 10, paragraph 585. And this refers to the great task, which Dr. Jung referred to later on in his life, when Dr. Jung said that the great task for theologians going forward will be the reinterpretation of all the religious myths to satisfy modern categories of understanding. Introduction. The drama of the archetypal life of Christ describes in symbolic images the events in the conscious life, as well as in the life that transcends consciousness of a man who has been transformed by his higher destiny. That quote comes from, from Dr. Jung's essay, A Psychological Approach to the Trinity, Psychology and Religion, Collected Work Number 11, Paragraph 233. Now I will begin the introduction in earnest. The life of Christ, understood psychologically, represents the vicissitudes of the self as it undergoes incarnation in an individual ego and of the ego as it participates in that divine drama. In other words, the life of Christ represents the process of individuation. This process, when it befalls an individual, may be salvation or calamity. As long as one is contained within a church or religious creed, he is spared the dangers of the direct experience. But once one has fallen out of containment in a religious myth, he becomes a candidate for individuation. Jung writes, quote, insofar as the archetypal content of the Christian drama was able to give satisfying expression to the uneasy and clamorous unconscious of the many, the consensus omnium raised this drama to a universally binding truth, not of course by an act of judgment, but by the irrational fact of possession, which is far more effective. Thus Jesus became the tutelary image or amulet against the archetypal powers that threatened to possess everyone. The glad tidings announced, quote, it has happened, but it will not happen to you inasmuch as you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, unquote. Yet it could, and it can, and it will happen to everyone in whom the Christian dominant has decayed. For this reason, there have always been people who, not satisfied with the dominance of conscious life, set forth, under cover and by devious paths, to their destruction or salvation, to seek direct experience of the eternal roots, and following the lure of the restless unconscious psyche, find themselves in the wilderness where, like Jesus, they come up against the son of darkness. There's a footnote, Psychology and Alchemy, Collected Works, number 12, paragraph 41. Through the centuries, a series of images has crystallized out of the collective psyche to serve the function of amulet against the archetypal powers. These nodal points of Christian art and experience 
express the essential stages in the life of Christ as chosen by the objective psyche itself, the consensus omnium. There is no specific number of these images. I have chosen 14 of the most prominent ones, the 14 chapters of this book to consider psychologically. This series of images depicts the unfolding of the Christian myth, which can be summarized as follows. God's preexistent, only begotten Son empties himself of his divinity and is incarnated as a man through the agency of the Holy Ghost, who impregnates the Virgin Mary. He is born in humble surroundings, accompanied by numinous events, and survives grave initial dangers. When he reaches adulthood, he submits to baptism by John the Baptist and witnesses the descent of the Holy Ghost, signifying his vocation. He survives the temptation by the devil and fulfills his ministry, which proclaims a benevolent, loving God and announces the coming of the kingdom of heaven. After agonizing uncertainty, he accepts his destined fate and allows himself to be arrested, tried, flagellated, mocked, and crucified. After three days in the tomb, according to many witnesses, he is resurrected. For 40 days, he walks and talks with his disciples and then ascends to heaven. Ten days later, at Pentecost, the Holy Ghost descends, the promised paraclete. The sequence of images which constitute the Christian myth begins and ends with the same image, the descent of the Holy Ghost. This suggests that the sequence may express a circular process which might be arranged as follows. Pentecost is a second annunciation, just as the first annunciation is followed by the birth of Christ. So the second annunciation is followed by the birth of the church. The church as the body of Christ is then destined to live out collectively the same sequence of images as did Christ. According to Hugo Rahner, quote, the earthly fate of the church as the body of Christ is modeled on the earthly fate of Christ himself. That is to say, the church, in the course of her history, moves towards a death. The death of the church as a collective carrier of the process opens up this archetypal cycle to psychological understanding and transfers its symbolism to the individual. This is what Jung means by continuing incarnation. Insofar as this cycle represents what happens to a man, it pictures the process of the ego's coming to consciousness. But insofar as it represents what happens to God incarnated in man, it pictures the transformation of God. This twofold process has now entered the range of the conscious experience of individuals. Once again, the Holy Ghost descends, this time to bring about a Christification of many. For the individual, this means, quote, not an imitation of Christ, but its exact opposite, an assimilation of the Christ image to his own self. It is no longer an effort, an intentional straining after imitation, but rather an involuntary experience of the reality represented by the sacred legend. There are several footnotes which I haven't read. Pentecost is considered to be the birthday of the church. Footnote four, quoted in Jung, Mysterium Conjunctionis, Collected Works, volume 14, paragraph 28, note 194. Edward Edinger, The Creation of Consciousness, pages 91 and following. Jung, Answer to Job, Psychology and Religion, Collected Works, Volume 11, paragraph 758. And Jung, Mysterium Conjunctionis, Collected Works, Volume 14, paragraph 492. This concludes my reading for today. I hope you will save the date for October 27th at 2 o'clock p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, when I will broadcast my talk, Finding the Living God. Thank you for joining me today.